Question I've got then is uh, from Steve Murray. He says, Beast from the East Live is one of the greatest displays of guitar work ever. You clearly steal the show. What are your memories of that tour in Japan? Could you feel at the time what you guys were doing on stage was so special? Well, I, th I think Beast of the East captured the kind of the apex of Dawkins' ability and all the years and years of touring we'd done. And that was recorded at the very tail end of the longest tour that we ever did. After all those, you know, dec that decade of touring, um, we'd done some massive tour, which was like this, I think it was Aerosmith in the States and then somebody else in the States and went to Europe with ACDC. And then we went to Japan <laughs> and we were just, we just didn't stop. It was crazy. And, um, we were starting to, the fatigue was starting to set in, I think, you know, mentally and everything else, physically and stuff, but we hadn't quite broke down yet. And I think that was the apex of our abilities as a band. I think we were at the top of our game right around that era. So I think it was I'm glad we recorded it. You know, it, it really is a testament to what a band can do uh, if they put, put the work in, you know, because quite honestly, when we first started out, <laughs> we were that good. And we just kept working at it. You know, we were very uh, self-critical, you know, so. And we knew our weaknesses and our strengths. And we tried to, you know, work at improving ourselves as a band. We would go out every night uh, and watch the headliner because we basically opened up for everybody else. You know, we, we weren't a headliner yet. And... Uh, we would always try to figure out the mechanics of why the headliner was the headliner and we weren't, you know, and go into the weeds and try to figure it out and just make little improvements every night. We listen to the board tape, we discuss it, we talk to our sound man, we just kept trying and trying and trying. You know, when we finally got our chance to headline a little bit, we were ready, you know, we were really very hungry for it. Yeah, it's fascinating to hear, actually, because you don't often hear about bands, um, almost a thought process behind something like that, because a lot of bands you hear about, especially from those kind of days, it was all excess. So kind of go on stage, do your party thing, and then go off and go and drink and do this. Like, so for you guys to have put that much thought into it and be premeditated in terms of watching and learning, that's that's quite interesting to, to hear that kind of thing went on. Well, we did the other thing, too. We, yes. <laughs> yeah, we're a very well-balanced band. Yeah. <laughs> uh yeah, we did both um but uh yeah i mean we, we were at the at, at the end of the day we were very serious about what we were doing i mean we you know we we had this kind of vision of what we wanted to be and what the impression we wanted to make on people physical impression we wanted to make on people live and, and you know and uh you know we were hungry and we wanted to be the best band in the world and um uh, it was just, uh, you know, we got to the point where we kind of reached a peak where I don't think we could have done much more with what we had to work with, if that makes any sense. And, uh, and we captured that in a moment, you know, on stage, which was pretty cool. And did you know you were going to, again, was this premeditated to record this and put this out as an album or is it just something you did off the cuff? Yeah, no, it was, you know, they had the recording trucks and everything. We recorded, I think, two nights make sure that we had it i can't it's been a while uh, but yeah no we it was all intentional and it was you know uh, there was a lot involved in that yeah good it's stuff very... talk about that being pro probably the apex it might have answered this next question from corbin shields he said uh, uh what would you consider to be your defining moments in dock both musically and personally defining moment um yeah, I, I'm sorry. I wish I had a, a good answer for you. There, there really wasn't, I don't think, that I can think of a moment. I mean, Dokken was uh, our, our, that whole Dokken experience was really just an incremental by degrees thing. Everything was so gradual. You know, our getting signed, you know, we got signed to a little label in Europe through a publishing deal we had in Germany, which led to a record with a record company in France. And then the record came out just in a limited way and it didn't and it failed and then it got 
picked up within the next year by an American company. And then, then we got dropped from that company. <laughs> And then we got re-signed to it later on down the road. So it was just this incremental thing. We started out touring very slowly in Europe and then we kind of built up and got on better, better shows. Then we got big management and that was okay. I would say that actually thinking about it and talking about it, when we got Q prime management, Cliff Bernstein and Peter Minch to manage us, that was probably the one biggest factor in our success. I will say that because they managed and Queensryche and I don't know how many other giant bands, you know, they were the biggest management company in the world yeah. and they really believed in us and they would not take no for an answer. And I think they took a mediocre band and made us a huge band because they were who they were. <laughs> so they could get us all the radio stations and they could get us on all the tours and they got us all the publicity and, you know, and got us great record deals and had us fire on all, cil on all cylinders. So I would give the credit, if I had to give the credit to any one entity for our success, it would be Q Prime. Fascinating again, fascinating. Um, the next one is from Mike Pajowski or Pajowski, I think. Uh, he says, I was a huge fan of Dokken, but the first Lynch Mob album, Wicked Sensation, blew my mind, been my favorite record ever since. Two questions. What are your feelings towards the album all these years on? And how did you talk Oni Logan into joining Lynch Mob from Viper? Well, I answered the, the, the last part of the question first. Uh, we were on this kind of worldwide search literally for, you know, to create the best band in the world and um, and to find the best guys and the singer being the key guy was the most important element. So we had feeders out, we were looking, we're looking and and uh, I got this cassette with Oni on it. Uh, I think it was, uh, uh, yeah, he was in Ferrari, I believe. And uh, he was in Ferrari. And um, so yeah, this, 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 it just, it was him and Ray Gillen. That was the two guys I wanted. and. And uh, we're kind of back and forth with Ray. And finally, Ray told me, listen, I'm, I'm, my band is my family and I, I can't I can't leave my guys. And I appreciate that because I feel the same way and I respected that. So I said, OK. Um, so I went after Oni, who was my second choice. And uh, we were all based in Arizona and Oni was in California playing a show at the Whiskey with Ferrari. <laughs> and we all flew out to L.A like a gang and we were going to show up and get our singer. It was really funny. And they knew we were coming and Wendy Dio managed them. She was there and they were ready for a war, a rumble. It was funny. And so we watched Oni, you know, we watched him play. Oni was great. Went backstage. He was there backstage. We're all dressed up in our, you know, early lynch mob clown suits and everything, big hair. And uh, I think the hair was coming down actually a little bit by then. And uh, when Oni came in and Wendy was standing there and she was, ready for a fight she was uh, yeah she was not nice and uh i said well my my line that was the the, the great like one-liner was do you want to you want to be in a band called ferrari or you want to drive one <laughs> i was really proud of that yeah uh so yeah uh but you know the band was really uh I had the catalyst of docking behind me, you know, uh, the recognition and the machine. I kept uh, the label. The label stayed with me, which is Electric, Warner Electric. Um, I got really powerful management. Q Prime stayed with Don. And, uh, but we had, you know, the, the lawyers, you know, the, the, the publicist, uh, the radio promotion people. We had the whole machine. And we had a, a massive record deal a 1.5 million dollar deal at that time was huge and uh, we spent every nickel of it on the band and uh, we lived pretty large and we had fun and we partied and we worked hard and uh, I put a great band together and the stuff just flowed out of that because you put all the right pieces together and then just kind of sit back and watch what, ha what happens that's kind of what happened those songs just flowed out of that amalgam of you know musicians it was really a very natural process 
It also took a year and a half to make the record. It wasn't an easy record to make, but <laughs> we knew we it had to be a seminal record and stand the test of time and this and that. We wanted to make a timeless album. And we wanted it to be wall to wall to where you never had to pick up that needle and go to the next track. You were just, you know. So um, I think we succeeded at that. And I think it has stood the test of time to a certain extent. Um, my One of my small regrets is that I didn't get the record done quicker before Nirvana came out and crushed everything. 